This is Professor Resnick again, and we're getting towards the end of uh, Economics 305, so I would like to finish up with uh, two themes. The first is uh, something called monopoly capital, or monopoly capitalism, and then the second, I'll, I'd like to talk a little bit about the United States using the uh, theoretical apparatus that we have studied in this course. First topic. Marx talks about competitive capitalism producing its opposite, its antithesis, which is that of monopoly capitalism. So the very struggle over super profits uh, that I presented to you and that Marx uh, discusses, that competition within every single industry across uh, the economy, can drive out of business a number of capitalists who just can't compete. That is, they can't raise their composition of capital as, as uh, fast as the others, can't, cannot drive down their average cost as fast as, as the others. And so they're literally driven out of business. They lose so much of their surplus value to the more successful capitalists that they die. The result is, the possi or the possibility is that the remaining capitalists form a significant share of the uh, production capacity in that particular industry. And what emerges is their power to uh, set the price. In other words, competition fades away and monopoly power uh, rises uh, instead. Marx calls this the centralization of capital in volume one of Capital. So uh, uh, what may emerge across capitalism in a variety of different industries is this fewer and fewer firms who are able to concentrate more and more production um, in their hands and hence have the power now to raise the, pro uh, the power to determine what is the price of the good that they're selling in the market. So I want to examine this centralization of capital um, in our two uh, commodities, the uh, consumer good industry, that is the means of, produ of uh, 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 subsistence commodities, consumer goods, and then in the capital good industry, the uh, means of uh, production industry, two different commodities, the V commodity, that's uh, uh, department two, and the C commodity, department one. So let's assume that we have uh, the emergence of monopoly in the wage good industry. And let's take our equation, and this is a, also a good review. We have then the C plus the V plus the S. And, and just to make sure that we understand what we have here, this is the wage good industry. So these are the few firms remaining in the wage and good industry. They now have the power to set the price and hence they can sell this value. They can sell this value for an amount for an amount a sales revenue price times quantity greater than the cost. And so they're in a favorable position because they have the power to set a price greater than the unit value, the exchange value per unit use value of the thing that's being produced here. Hence, their total revenues exceeds the cost, and I'm including, obviously, in the cost, the, the, the surplus. What this means uh, uh, geometrically is that here's the price. Let's put in our supply and our demand. And this is the quantity for this. Well, let me not use Q. Let me use yeah. This is the use values that are being produced and sold. So this firm somehow has set this, I'm going to call it a monopoly price, which is higher than the previous competitive price. That's where we start. I'm assuming the competitive price is the same as the unit value. And so the firm, by driving out of business its competitors, that's the somehow, has now in its hands the power to set a price above the equilibrium. Okay. So the market, which is this, supply and demand, is no longer determining the price of the product. The PC is no longer the price. Rather, the firm is a price maker. It has the power to do that, or the few firms are price makers, and they set PM. Okay. Notice something interesting here. This firm by setting this price, we'll sell this much, which is quite a bit of difference of what it was selling before. So this is the original, this is the new. And you might ask, 
is it possible for this firm to raise its price and sell more than UVN? In other words, get close to this. And the answer is yes. If the firm can make a very inelastic demand, at the DN, if the firm somehow faces a very inelastic demand, then it won't lose too much in sales if it raises its price. That's very important in the case of monopoly because the firm now has an incentive to try and create an inelastic demand for its particular product. What do we mean by that? If you recall in economics, an inelastic demand is a kind of necessary good. There are very few substitutes for that particular good. So if this firm can mount an advertising campaign at you know, that, and to go back to the beginning of the course, that's a cultural part of the economy. If it can mount an advertising campaign, produce a whole set of new theories to persuade individuals to buy this good, and there's no few, there are no good substitutes for it, then it can raise its price and not lose, it'll lose a few, but not lose much sales. In other words, its total revenues will rise, it won't lose too much on the sales side if it can persuade individuals to purchase this particular good. So in this particular case, the monopoly price that it charges, and this is what it sells right over there, it won't lose too much sales, again, if it persuades individuals that this is a necessary good. So let's put it all together. The firm then, this is the socially necessary abstract labor time to produce the good. It sells it for a, a, a worth, a value greater than this. And then I'm going to add here precisely what that is. That's a non-class revenue. The non-class revenue is precisely the difference between the price of this particular product and its unit value of that particular product. That's the differential right here, the non-class revenue that the firm receives. Okay, by being able to, to you know, sell it for this particular product, a market price, a monopoly market price greater than the unit value. So it's really, you know, this, this distance here times, you know, that distance over there. And that's equal then to the price of M times what it is sold, okay? So in monopoly capitalism, these non-class revenues loom large. Notice something. The firm is still exploiting individuals. That's the surplus here. Let me remind you, surplus is, that it's pumping out of its workers. But this firm is getting something else. It's getting a non-class revenue, okay, by selling the good for more than what it's worth. So this is a, what, we, what we discussed a little bit before. This is unequal exchange. So we're changing um, the assumption of Marx in enabling this firm to sell its commodities at a price higher than the unit values, thereby earning um, a, a non-class revenue. Times the goods sold, okay? So, this NCR has nothing to do with class exploitation. This don't confuse the two now at the end of the course. This is class exploitation. This is unequal exchange. This is the use of power to set a price greater than the unit value times the goods sold. And if this is still large, okay, the NCR can loom very large. In this case, then, the rate of profit for the firm is the surplus. So let me call this the monopoly rate of profit is the surplus plus this non-class revenue divided by C plus V, okay? And this can go up quite a bit if this is relatively important. Okay, so that's the payoff for for uh, monopoly uh, capitalism. Notice something else in this. Okay, I want to come back to this point of advertising. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's take this numerator here. The surplus value of this firm plus the non-class revenue. Okay. That's, in a sense, it's new gross profits. Then will be equal to the subsumed class payments 
that it makes the secure, the conditions of existence of the surplus value, just like we've been doing throughout the course. But we have something new, this NCR. And over here, you can add another expenditure, say advertising over there. And the advertising helps to secure the non-class revenue. And one could make an argument that the inequality goes in this direction. That is, it's true you have to firm incurs a new expenditure to help secure this, but these may be so large that it exceeds the expenditures necessary to, maintain, to secure and maintain the monopoly position to get the price higher than the unit value. So there's a strong, there's a, you know, and the profit rate, you know, takes off. Two other comments on this. You might say, well, monopolies are illegal. That's absolutely correct. What I have on the blackboard is not legal. There are, in the United States, there are laws in the book passed at the turn of the last century, you know, after the 1900s, which say firms shall not have monopoly power, okay? Federal laws. And so what, what I have on the blackboard is, is, is not legal, but, of course, to, and again, to go back to the first part of the course, the firm will hire economists and lobbyists and lawyers to make an argument, if anybody raises this question, that they're not a monopoly, they're a competition. Okay? And there's many, this is a fascinating and interesting example of the epistemology where the lawyer is going to try and persuade a judge and or jury, a lawyer representing this firm, that that which is on the blackboard doesn't exist, rather it's, it's, it's a competitive firm. And on the other side, if it were the federal government that were prosecuting this under the that this firm had violated the laws because it did have monopoly power, and the, the, the other lawyers representing the, the state would make an argument that it is a monopoly, and then you would have a struggle between these two different kinds of theorizations of whether or not there was monopoly present. So included in the why would not only be advertising, but I probably should in be all the legal, the, 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 the fees for lawyers and lobbyists and so forth, and economists, arguing um, that the firm is not a monopolist, but rather it's a, it's a competitive firm. So here is a way of handling then, using our value and surplus value theory in the case of monopoly. Let me erase this and then uh, ask, so what? What's the consequences of this? Besides the firm having a higher profit rate, so what? So let me do two things on this. And erase this from the board and examine that particular I hope interesting question. Consequences of monopoly power in, once again, in the consumer good industries, okay? Well, first, the workers who, the value of their labor power, they have a problem now. Because since this is consumer goods, they have to pay higher prices for all their goods. So the inequality for, for the workers goes this way, assuming their wages don't change, that is the socially necessary abstract labor time to produce the goods to sustain the laborers, that doesn't change, then they would have to pay higher prices, assuming monopoly is in all the means of subsistence, okay? They would have to pay higher prices for the goods that they are demanding, that they want to maintain their uh, standard of living. So they have a crisis on their hands. So the uh, uh, monopoly power in the means of subsistence industries, which is good for them, it gives them a higher profit rate, the way I've done it here, comes at the cost of the workers, because the workers have to pay a higher price for those goods that they, they desire. And so this can't be sustained. And so one way, what, one possibility here, it's one possibility, is that the real wage falls. That is, the use values purchased by the workers falls. <coughs> so the workers receiving the same wages, having, paying higher prices, the only way they can maintain this balance is to lower their consumption. That's what this is, lowering their consumption of, of consumer goods, okay? And that, of course, would create a problem for those uh, uh, firms trying to produce and sell as they get a paradox, which is may push them more to, to advertising and manipulation and so forth. Secondly, it's possible that the workers could try 
and ask for higher wages to balance this. It's possible that the workers might uh, go into debt, add something to the left-hand side of the equation so that they could help finance this. It's possible that workers, that everybody in the family could go to work to get a, an extra wages over here. Um, so everyone in family might work. To add to the, if this were the, the male, to add to the male's labor power, a, you know, the, the spouse's or the female's labor power, or other people within the family as well, to afford this. Okay, so all these are possibilities here. I just want to examine for a moment this one, okay, since it's important in, in, in U.S. history. So I'd like to just talk about increase in wages. Suppose the workers had strong unions. Let's go back in time. Let me set this up historically. Suppose this is the 1950s, 60s, um, into the 70s, that 30-year period. And suppose the unions in the United States were strong, and they had a good deal of monopoly power. And so what you had is the monopoly power on the side of unions who are trying to set a price for the labor power, because that's what the workers are selling, higher than, than the uh, value of labor power, whilst at the same time you had the the individuals, the corporations that were buying the labor power, they had power in the product market. That is, they could set a price, like I just did, for the consumer goods higher than the unit value. Suppose you had the juxtaposition of these two different kinds of monopolists, and let's see what might happen. Okay? So workers, let's start with the workers. Workers would try and get a price of labor power greater than the little v. Remember, that's the value per unit. Okay? Suppose they were successful. Suppose the workers were able to get a new subsumed class revenue from the capitalists in the means of production industry. Okay, so that would be the price of labor power times all the workers times the hours they work. Suppose the union then bargained with uh, the union representing the workers bargained with the capitalists, and what they bargained for was a a, a higher uh, uh, real wage. That is, they took into account that the workers had to pay higher prices for the consumer goods. So when they sat down at the, at the when the contract ran out, they sat down with the corporations and they said, "Look, we don't just want to. We want a higher money wage to compensate the workers for the higher prices that they have to pay." So in effect, the unions are bargaining for a higher real wage. So they want a higher price higher than the unit value of, that, uh, of those workers in order to compensate for the higher prices. And suppose they were successful. Well, if they were successful, then the workers, all the workers, would get a value of labor power plus the subsumed class revenue, and then they could go out and indeed pay these higher prices. Okay? And so they might be able to maintain their, their standard of living to what it was before, their real wage, because now they're asking for this subsumed class revenue, this extra, to balance the higher prices that they have to pay okay, for, for the goods and services. Um, so, you know, in effect, they want this subsumed class revenue to kind of match the higher prices on these goods. That's what the union will bargain for, okay? To get an extra revenue for the workers to balance the higher prices that the workers have to pay for those goods, okay? So what the workers have is monopoly power via their union to try and shift up the, the, the price in the labor power market what in effect is happening, supply of labor power, demand for labor power, what in effect is happening here is that the union is trying to set a higher price of labor power, higher than the unit value of labor power. To take into account, let's say, uh, I mean to take into account lots of things, but in this example, to take into account the higher prices the workers have to pay for their consumer goods. And again, suppose the workers are successful in this. Uh, by the way, just to complete this, I suppose I should add in here, this would be a union dues. 
because the workers would have to pay uh, uh, some dues to support their monopoly position. Okay, so let me get rid of this. And let's go back to see what's going on with the capitalists. The capitalists get a surplus, then they get this non-class revenue. Class exploitation here, and uh, a monopoly position here, okay? And they have a subsumed class payments that they make to secure the conditions of existence of surplus value. But then now we have a new problem. Now they have to make a new subsumed class payment to the union, that is to the workers, because of the workers' union. Plus they have uh, the advertising that I talked about. The advertising to secure this, okay? Here, the workers getting a higher price for their labor power force the capitalists to pay a higher price for that labor power. So it is as if the it it it, it is as if the, the capitalists have to pay an access fee to get access to labor power. That's what this is. So the subsumed class revenue for the workers is exactly equal to the subsumed class payment by the capitalists. So the workers get a higher price for their labor power, that's precisely what the capitalists have to pay. And it comes out of their surplus. So the question is, we ha so this is the uh, uh, monopoly payment to workers. So the question is now, okay, which is bigger? We have the monopoly power on the <laughs> output side that the capitalists enjoy. Then we have a monopoly payment to the workers that the workers enjoy and that the capitalists have an extra cost involved. So this is the benefit to the capitalist by getting a monopoly on the selling side. This is the cost to the capitalist by facing a monopoly on their input side. This is the, you know, this is the cost to the capitalist of facing a monopoly. On the input side, this is the benefit to the capitalist of having a monopoly on the output side on what they're selling. And the question is, which way does the inequality go? Okay. Suppose, to make a long story short and to finish this story, suppose the workers are able to get a higher subsumed class payment, which is their revenue, from the capitalists to offset the higher prices that they have to pay, and that forces the capitalists to charge higher prices on the goods that they're trying to sell to offset this new cost. In other words, this plus over here forces the capitalist to charge even higher prices, which in turn forces the workers to get higher price of labor power to offset that, which forces the capitalist to charge higher prices. Let me do one more, <laughs> which forces this, which forces well, you know, what do we have here? What we have is what was called in the 1960s and 70s a wage price spiral. We have inflation. So what we're done here is a, a class analysis of how inflation may occur in a society. That is, the higher prices over here stimulate higher price of labor power. This is the higher prices of, of output. And so the monopolies struggling with one another force up prices and you you end up with a general um, inflation then the question would be would then the question there would be you know okay what does the federal government do uh, when these inflationary conditions arise and one of the things that, that people argued at the time um, was that uh, uh, what the Federal Reserve Board did um, who had control over the money supply was just pump up the money supply um, to match the increased demand for money supply and basically help to finance this inflation. In other words, to go back to what we did a long time ago, the, the demand for money, if you recall, was the value of, I, it's a little bit of a problem. I understand I've been using V for the value of uh, uh, labor power. So uh, let me write this out. 
this is the value of goods and services in the economy. That's in labor times, okay? Um, and if you recall, um, this was over the value of gold. But suppose we don't have gold. We just have the Fed um, uh, controlling uh, the money supply here. So it's, uh, it's a non-commodity money. It's just the Fed pumping up um, the money supply. So we basically we have here dollars divided by hours. This is equal to the summation of market prices. So if, if the market prices rise because of inflation, okay, so the, the, that's what we've done. If the market price is rising because of inflation on the input-output side, so the demand for money will rise. And then if the Fed just pumps up the money supply like it can, what happens if there's no change in the value of goods and services, basically, this falls. Okay. In effect, what's happened is the, I don't know how to, you know, what words to use here, but the, the conversion factor between value and, and uh, this non-commodity money changes because the hours remain the same, but by pumping up more, su more money supply, the dollars per unit hours falls, and that's what the Fed has done. And, and that continued um, until... Um, a new, I can't remember his name, someone came along who said, no, this won't happen, and did reduce the money supply, raised interest rates, and basically caused the recession to squeeze out the inflation in the economy. Um, I, that may have been under President Reagan. I just, I, I, I don't recollect, okay? So that's this analysis over here, okay? The next question, which is also interesting, I think, is what happens if there's monopoly in the capital good industry, okay? The department one industry. So let me erase this. And suppose we had monopoly in this other industry. I don't have to do this in such detail. I think you can get the idea. Here we have a, 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 a few capitalists who, again, because of competition or other reasons, gain uh, monopoly power in a capital good industry and they're able to charge a price higher than the unit value. So once again, we have the C plus B plus S, except now it's in a capital good industry. So this is a C good industry. The, other, the previous one was a V good industry. And they can sell their, their, their product for a price, a monopoly price, greater than the value of producing that, okay? So in this particular case, okay, in contrast to the other case, they're selling this particular commodity because it's a raw material or a machine. They're selling it to other capitalists. And hence, those other capitalists have a surplus by definition. And so they take a cut. These are the, now the buying capitalists. They, they, they get a cut of the surplus. And they, in effect, make a new subsumed class payment to these sellers of a monopoly capital commodity. Let me take the case of oil. If the uh, 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 capitalists in the oil industry, very important raw material, if they get a monopoly, they can sell that particular very important raw material energy to other capitalists who now have to make a new subsumed class payment to the monopolized commodity. So in this particular case, if this was the uh, uh, oil, the few capitalists left in the oil industry, they would be selling their particular product to other capitalists, and they would be then getting a subsumed class revenue. Okay. So this would be the monopolists in this industry. They sell their commodity, say energy, to other capitalists. Those other capitalists have to take a cut of their surplus and make a new subsumed class payment to this group of capitalists, and that's their subsumed class revenue. Okay, so this reflects the price of this particular product greater than the, you know, this is the C commodity here. Okay, so this is a monopoly power in the C industry, means of production, oil. Okay, so the, the, the oil industry, the industry that refines that oil, standard oil and so forth, they can sell their commodity for a higher price than what it's worth in value terms. They get a subsumed class revenue, which is a subsumed class payment 
of these other industries that have to pay this now premium higher than the unit value. So their profit rate goes up too. As you can see, their profit rate now go, becomes the surplus plus this subsumed class revenue in this monopoly. So those capitalists in the selling industry that have this monopoly position have a higher rate of profit. Okay? However, uh, by the way, I, you know, just to be consistent here in terms of what we did before, you would have the surplus value plus this subsumed class revenue here. Um, and it's likely this would exceed the subsumed class payments plus the new expenditures that would be warranted. So this would be advertising and uh, lob lobbyists and so forth, lawyers, um, to help secure the, the conditions of existence of this new monopoly revenues here. And my guess is that those revenues would exceed these new costs of advertising plus lawyers and so forth to maintain the monopoly position. Um, we might ask now the consequences of this. Okay, well, here, let's see, I'm, I'll erase this and I'll put it below it. These are the, the capital good in industries, the, these are the sellers of this commodity, of this, you know, raw material, sellers of C. Here, these are the buyers of C. The buyers have a surplus that they pump out of their workers, but now they have a new problem. They have all the subsumed class payments that they have to make to secure this, but they have a new one. They have to purchase this C good, you know, oil, they have to purchase this C good at a price, monopoly price, greater than its cost. Okay, that's on the input side. And so the inequality for them goes in this direction. So we have an interesting problem here. For the sellers, they get a surplus value plus a subsumed class revenue greater than the uh, uh, expenditures to secure it plus their uh, uh, X, whereas they benefit from monopoly, whereas the buyers are hurt by the monopoly position. And so you, you, know, you might ask, okay, since <coughs> we have in the, uh, in the, we have uh, the, you know, the juxtaposition of two different kinds of, of, of capitalists here, those capitalists that have a monopoly position by selling a raw material or a machine good at a price higher than the unit value, and those that have to pay, you know, which inequality outweighs? If this one outweighs this one, then the benefit here would exceed the cost, and the economy could expand because these capitalists might use this to, you know, expand subsumed class payments. If the if that is not the case, if, the, if this inequality is very strong, then you might have a contraction across the U.S. economy because these monopolists have a, a, this kind of monopoly position. And this gets very interesting and complicated. For example, you might ask, what do capitalists do with these monopoly revenues? That is, if I just add back If I add back the monopoly in the consumer good industry that we started with, and now we have monopoly in the capital good industry, and if the inequalities are going in this way, then you can ask, okay, what do the capitalists do with these extra revenues? And that's very, very interesting and controversial. One argument that, that has emerged is that the capitalists will not attempt to expand the uh, supply of their particular uh, means of uh, subsistence or means of production because that will only tend to undermine their monopoly position. That's why, they, <laughs> that's why they're making use of advertising there to get people to buy it at a higher price. Okay, so they're not going to expand the supply which would tend to undermine their monopoly position. So you have, which people have argued, uh, uh, that a monopoly capitalism may breed um, stagnation 
is that the firms are not pushing to expand the supply of, of uh, the particular commodities that they are monopolizing. And so you have, which is what an argument did appear in the 1960s and 70s, you have the combination of inflation, this wage price spiral, stagnation, and they called it, if I remember correctly, stagflation at the time. A new term was, was uh, coined to capture both the, the stagnation and the inflation. On the other hand, you also could make an argument that these great monopoly revenues here will stimulate these particular uh, uh, monopolized industries to use their extra profits that they're getting uh, from in the, the monopoly position, that's this right over here, to enter into new industries or create new products. And in this particular case, you could make an argument that, that, comp that the very monopoly presence stimulates new forms of competition. And in fact, that's an argument that Marx actually made. So Marx, because you know, he's a master, of, you know, by now we all understand the dialectic, this overdetermination. So the, the competition breeds monopoly, and then in turn the monopoly breeds competition. So you can think of a variety of different industries in which the very monopoly positions that they have in a particular product stimulates them to create all kinds of new competitive positions. For example, if this is the oil, if we're talking about oil here, so the oil uh, companies have both a, a, a non-class revenue because they sell gasoline to automobiles, that's a consumer good, that, that is the gasoline is a, is, is a consumer good, you need that obviously to run a car. So they get a non-class revenue, but they also get a subsumed class revenue because they sell uh, um, energy to other uh, capitalists who need that energy to produce uh, uh, goods in the economy. Okay. So if, if they're in a favored position to, to charge higher and higher prices at the pump and to other capitalists, so their revenues, their monopoly revenues rise, and of course their stock prices would rise, what do they do with their money? What do they do with their profits? Well, you know, people have argued one of the things that the board of directors may do with these rising monopoly revenues is to uh, create new forms of energy. They may invest in R&D, research and development on the right hand side, in, uh, in all kinds of new energy sources. Um, they have the wherewithal to do that and it would be a strategic kind of investment. Um, and if some of them pay off in new forms of energy, they will be producing new forms of, of, of commodities and hence be able to make a surplus value in those um, in the future. But you can run that kind of, of uh, argument for a variety of different kinds of capitalists that would develop new kinds of strategies to produce new kinds of, of, of commodities in a variety of different industries um, in order to uh, uh, you know, be competitive there in the future or to create new kinds of competition for other firms which have a, a competitive position. The last thing I would like to do, and then I'm going to stop on this, is to just to take the example, because it's so important today, of uh, oil um, and, and run with that, because it's an interesting example in which I can kind of summarize everything that we've done on this question of monopoly. Suppose we have, then, in this a very important product, which so far there are a few substitutes available in this case of oil. We have, um, in a variety of different countries, uh, let's take, say, OPEC, we have, uh, um, in these oil-producing countries, uh, uh, state um, uh, enterprises, they, that is, the state sets up an enterprise to uh, pump oil out of the ground. And the cost of that, in Marxian terms, is C plus V plus SV. But since OPEC is a monopoly, it sells its oil at a price higher than the value. So it gets a subsumed class revenue. And it sells its oil to uh, other capitalists who refine that oil and produce energy, whether it be for the home and automobile or to use in, in factories. So OPEC sells the oil at a price, this is a C good, greater than the unit value. So this is the oil producing capitalists literally pumping the oil out of the ground, barrels of oil. This is the cost, the total value of those oils. This is the 
subsume class revenue that they can get because the, the countries, you know, go to Geneva or wherever they go, they sit around a table and the oil ministers the, decide a higher price for the oil greater than the unit value and then they allocate uh, how much, uh, how many barrels of oil the respective countries uh, can produce. So they can then sell their oil And it's a fairly inelastic demand because there's no really good substitute for oil right now. That's what everybody is trying to do, is to find this substitute for, for oil. And that would include, as I just mentioned to you, the oil companies uh, themselves. That is, the companies that refine this. So they get a nice subsume class revenue. They sell the oil to um, oil refining capitalists around the world. Let me take the United States. Let me focus on the U.S. So we have, in the, in, in, in the case of the United States, we have capitalists who purchase barrels of oil and then refine it. You know, the, for those of you uh, who are familiar with this, uh, between uh, New York City and Philadelphia, we have a variety of, of companies there along the New Jersey Turnpike um, on the East Coast that refine this oil. So that's not the only place, obviously, but that's one place that I'm familiar with. So these oil refining companies, they get a, um, they get a, uh, a, a surplus value. They get the C plus V plus SV. They get a surplus value. Okay. But they also refine the oil. So this is the surplus they get in refining the oil. But they're able to sell this at the pump at the gas pump for a price higher than the, the unit value, and so they get a non-class revenue. And what this is, the monopoly position at the pump, at the gas pump, <laughs> let me write the pump, for means of subsistence, for consumer goods. So here is the first thing we discussed. This is the non-class revenue they get by selling it the good at a price higher than unit value. But they also sell to other capitalists. So they also get a subsumed class revenue. Okay. And of course, they have the subsumed class payments to secure this in New Jersey, plus the, the uh, uh, Y, plus, if I, I hope I got the same right terms here, plus the X to secure these respective monopoly positions. This would be then you know, advertising and lawyers here um, for these respective monopoly positions. And my guess is the inequality goes this way. Okay? So we have the oil producing countries okay, they get a surplus value um, greater than this, that is to make it perfectly consistent, they get a surplus value plus the subsumed class revenue. And my guess is this is greater, plus whatever expenditures they have to, to make to, to, you know, to get this monopoly position. So my guess is th that their inequality goes this way. And what that means is that the monopoly revenues of OPEC become larger and larger and larger. Okay. Why? Because they charge a higher price for the barrels of oil to the refineries. So the refineries in turn have a monopoly position and they're able to charge higher and higher prices for the consumer goods that they sell. That's gasoline at the pump. That keeps going up. That's the price of the V good greater than the unit value. As well as the price of the C good that they're selling to other capitalists. And so these swell in the, uh, in the uh, uh, standard oil of New Jersey in the companies that are purchasing the oil from, from OPEC and, re and refining it and then selling it as either consumer goods um, or as a, a, a means of production, as a, a raw materials to other capitalists. And so you can see what would happen in this example of what economists sometimes call sequential monopoly. A higher price for uh, barrels of oil gets translated into higher prices at the pump as what the, the, the company that's refining the oil has the 
power to pass on the higher prices into higher prices at the pump and higher prices for more raw material to the other capitalists. And the re end result of this is something that people worry about right now, which is that the workers have a higher price for the V good that they have to spend. That would be gas times you know, the, the gas that they purchase for their cars. And then, of course, there's everything else. I'll just put everything else down here. So all their other consumption here. So this is gas consumption, OK, gas consumption, plus everything else. Well, you can see what happens. As the price of gas goes up, then the, and they can't really drop this too much. If you get an automobile, what are you going to do? You can't push it with your foot. You need gas. So is this is a very inelastic demand. And as this goes up, People worry about cutting into other kinds of expenditures. All these other consumptions would fall, and that may hurt the recovery. Say by the same logic, um, for the other capitalists, they now have to pay. These are now the buying capitalists. They now have to pay a higher and higher price for energy. So that's the C good that they're buying over here. And if that keeps going up, then these may fall, OK? So if on the consumer side, we get a drop in consumption. Over here, we get a drop in these expenditures. If one of these is delta C plus delta V, if that falls, then you have, as a result of a higher, put it all together, a higher price for the barrels of oil set by cartel, higher costs to the uh, oil refinery companies. So they have to pay a higher cost. Let me get that in here explicitly for the raw material oil. So that goes up. This gets, because they're paying a higher price. The bump, the increase here is a result of these oil companies paying a higher subsumed class payment. That's where this extra revenue comes. But then the oil companies, offset their higher cost to OPEC by charging higher prices for gasoline and for raw materials. And so their revenues can swell above and beyond what they're paying to OPEC. But the end result of this on the US economy is a, is a terrible, if you want to think of it that way, tax on workers and tax on other industrial capitalists. And that could lead to a, a, a recession. So that's how we might make use of this kind of surplus or value and surplus value analysis to understand something which is going on um, in the US economy right at the present. And I shall stop with that.